Let's pray. Gracious God, we ask you to be in and among us in this time together. I pray that you will take the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and make it acceptable in your sight. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. It's about two years ago, uh, I was crawling into bed one night, turned to my wife Rebecca and said, you know, Beck, I think that this opportunity at Gordon College may actually materialize. And uh, I'm just wondering what's going to happen with my research. It was January of 2011, and I had been spending the last seven and a half years of my life working on a big research project and set a goal of trying to interview 550 senior leaders. At that point, I was at uh, 98 people short. Rebecca said, well, you know, uh, Michael, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you've been working on this majority of our married life. So you're certainly not going to quit now. Figure out how to do something and get busy. I've learned after almost 18 years of marriage that uh, when my wife tells me to get busy, that's what I should do. Her wish is my command. So I was teaching every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday that semester, and I would fly out to different places every Tuesday and Thursday. And in about five and a half months, I finished 98 interviews. My last interview was with uh, Drew Faust, the president of Harvard. It was a fitting in to my season of being a faculty member and moving into college administration. How is it for you? Has there ever been a big project that when you look at it, you think there is no way this is going to get completed? Maybe it was a science fair project or starting a student club or an Eagle Scout project. My hunch is that every single person in this room has been at that place when you thought, I cannot see this to completion. But then somehow, miraculously, God's able to bring it to fruition. When I was in high school, a friend gave me a book by an author and a pastor named Chuck Swindoll. It's a book called Hand Me Another Brick. It's not the most learned book that I read in high school, nor is it the best written. But it actually changed my life. Because in so doing, this pastor introduced me to the story of Nehemiah. And I've not been the same since. As Kristen read from Nehemiah's um, account, it's an interesting guy. The book of Nehemiah details one of the most significant public works undertaken in all of the Bible. It occurred about 500 years before the birth of Christ. And it's basically the story of rebuilding the wall that surrounded Jerusalem. It amazingly occurred in just 52 short days. And yet it was something that had remained undone for 140 years. How is it that a community was able to suddenly do something in 52 days that had not been done in three generations? I'm here to say that this morning it occurred because the right person was in the right place and was willing to do the right thing for the Lord. This is not a, a story of Nehemiah doing it all on his own. This is actually a project that involved thousands of people. But the biblical account actually pays attention to uh, the single individual more than others. So this morning, I want to see how we might identify with him and how lessons from his life could be instructive for our own. One of the interesting things about uh, Nehemiah is that he was the right person for many different reasons. But if you look at the book of Nehemiah, you get a sense that the real reason why God used him was because he was a man who was devoted to God. The book of Nehemiah is relatively short, just 13 short chapters. You could read it straight through in about 30 minutes. I encourage you to do that. It's a great book. It's a great story. In those 13 short chapters, we learn of 10 different episodes where Nehemiah prayed. He was an interesting man because he believed that prayer was the key to getting things done. It's also interesting because Nehemiah was taken by the fact that this wall was torn down around Jerusalem and it made it vulnerable for military invasion. Now, you know, the Jews had been carried into exile twice. They'd gone to Egypt as well as into Babylon. And so they were especially vulnerable to what this might mean in their own lives. One of the things that has always amazed me about the Lord is that 
He's a God who takes our own particular passions and calls us to a place of service. Every one of us have different things that get us excited, different things that we worry about, different things that are on our mind. For some people, it's about matters of justice. And when, they see, when we see acts of injustice, we're drawn to action. For other people, it's about care for the poor. For others, it's about the life of the mind. For others, it's evangelism. The great thing about God is that he takes the thing that you are most passionate about and finds a way of creating opportunities for you to use your gifts to do something great. That's how it was with Nehemiah. One of the big questions that you want to think about while you're here at Gordon is what is it that you're most passionate about? And how can God use that to make a difference in the world around us? The Bible tells us time and again that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. One of the reasons why Nehemiah was the right person because he was a man of prayer. How is it with you? If you had to calculate how many minutes you've spent in prayer over the last week, what would that figure be? Would it be five minutes? Ten minutes? Maybe an hour? If we claim to walk in the light as he is in the light, as 1 John tells us, we have to spend time with the Lord. Prayer is the key by which God unleashes his will in our lives. So if you're trying to seek what is God's will for me after I graduate or this summer or what should I be doing, let me just ask, how's your prayer life? The other thing that's very special about Nehemiah is that because of his active prayer life, he had a way of keeping his ego in check. Now that's important because one of the things I want to really talk about this morning is how we can do great things for God. But the temptation whenever you start to undertake something big is that you can begin to think more highly of yourself as you ought. Nehemiah doesn't do that. Nehemiah is a very interesting case study because faith and action are held in tension with one another. How much do we depend upon the Lord to do something and how much do we depend on our own selves to get something done? The great insight of Nehemiah is that the results that God wants for the world around us, the redemption that he wants to bring about in our world, is tied to the work that we are doing and the closeness connection that we have with God's work. Nehemiah was the right person because he was a man of prayer, because he was committed to God. But he was also the right person because he was in the right place. We read about him being named the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. We don't have cupbearers per se, but you can think about it as a precursor to the secret service. So the cupbearer was the person who oftentimes would taste uh, the, the food or drink that was being served to the king because he would check to make sure that the king was not being poisoned. As a result, the cupbearer had a very, very close relationship with the king, oftentimes traveled with the king, and throughout Uh, his term he was considered to be very close to power there's been a debate that's been occurring within the American church over the last five to ten years and that is how much should people of faith seek worldly power there have been entire books and articles and debates that have been housed on this particular subject and it's a right and fitting one because The Bible tells a very complex picture. You think about Jesus' earthly ministry. He clearly has a preference for the poor, spends most of his time with people who don't have very much power. And you can think about how oftentimes, Sermon on the Mount being one of them, where he calls us out to lives of meekness and humility, not to power and to privilege. In my own life, I can see that some of the most powerful times in which God has been at work in the world around me have occurred through the lives of people who don't have much power at all. A Burmese woman, a grandmother who didn't go to college, a child with special needs. God does use the poor, the weak, and the lowly to shame the wise, without a doubt. But I also spent a lot of time thinking about what does this all mean for us as American Christians in 2013? Does the countercultural nature of the gospel compel us to eschew the halls of power? 
I became convinced about five years ago that while it is true it is very difficult for you to maintain your integrity and a godly perspective when you're in positions of power, in fact, much good can occur in those environments. Last week I had an email exchange with the biblical studies department here. I see my friend Roger Green here and maybe some other colleagues. And in that conversation we were talking about the right and fitting place of godly people within secular institutions. It's interesting because the Bible is full of stories of how God uses institutions to accomplish his will. And sometimes that occurs in ways you wouldn't expect at all. For example, sometimes God uses secular even evil institutions to do what he wants. Professor Marv Wilson pointed out to me that it was the Babylonian state and Nebuchadnezzar in particular that God used to purify Judah of idolatry. In Jeremiah 25, God actually refers to Nebuchadnezzar as, quote, my servant. Who would have thought? You see, ours is a God who does use institutions to accomplish his will. But if you look throughout the whole of Scripture, what you see is that most often, God wants to do good things through institutions that are led by godly people. Much good occurs when Joseph is in a very senior position in Egypt, or Esther, or Ruth, or Deborah, or Paul, or Nehemiah. You see, we spend too much time in the evangelical church thinking about getting individuals right, individual transformation, when in fact we need to think much bigger, much broader, because God cares for the entire world. And he does that not just through rightly ordered people, but also rightly ordered institutions. How in the world are we going to get the world in a better place if they're not godly people doing godly good in major organizations and institutions? So here's my call to you, Gordon College. It's time to dream big. I'm tired of the parochialism, the narrow-mindedness, the sense that we're going to do something in a small way. It's time for us to take on something big. If Nehemiah could lead a team of folks to rebuild a wall in 52 days, a wall that had lay in ruin for 140 years, don't you think it's possible that God could be calling you to do something amazing in this place, in this time? In order to do that, it requires a good bit of intentionality. So one of the great things about the four years that you spend here at Gordon is that it gives you a chance to take stock of your life and to say, Lord, what can I do that would make a real difference in the world? And how can I get myself in a place to be able to make that difference? Part of it means taking more risks. I'll say one particular word that I find disconcerting. It's an honest word. We're 60% women on our campus. We had an information session for the Presidential Fellows Program, and I think we had four women show up. 40% men on this campus, and yet 80% of the people who were interested in the program were men. Ladies, what's up with that? It's time to rise up. You've got a president who would like to have women in more leadership positions. So get busy. It's interesting because a lot of times we think about power in all the wrong ways. We think about how we're not leading an organization or we're not headed to go to the Oval Office or we're not doing those kinds of things. When in fact, we don't even realize how powerful we are at this very moment. If there has ever been an assembled group of Christ followers who are positioned and primed to make a huge difference in the world, a huge difference in the world. It is the people in this room, in this hour, right now. Think about this. You work with your laptop. Some of you are playing with your smartphones even now. Guess what? You don't even think about that when in fact 20% of the world's population doesn't even have electricity to be able to charge those devices, much much less the money to be able to afford them or the service plans. We don't think a thing about reading the words on the screen when the, they're not the gospel choir. What are you called again? God's chosen. When God's chosen is leading us in worship. 
You don't think a thing about that. And guess what? One in five adults over age 15 cannot even read those words. You don't think a thing about it. That you can go to the bathroom or wash your hands or eat food that you know is going to keep you healthy. When 2.6 billion people on this planet, that's 40% of the world's population, doesn't have access to basic sanitation. And here's the kicker. 80% of the world's population, that's four out of five people, they live on less than $10 a day. You spend more of that on food every day. Friends, if there has ever been a generation of committed, smart, talented Christ followers who are well positioned to do something a lot bigger than rebuild a wall, it is the folks in this room. But... The Bible tells us we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I think one of the biggest sins of American Christianity is that we downplay the opportunities and the gifts that we've been given as a way to justify the fact that we haven't done a whole lot with those gifts. Truth be told, we've been pretty bad stewards of the opportunities the Lord has given to us. My generation has certainly not set a good example of this. But the good news is that ours is a God who makes all things new. Just because that's the way it's been does not mean that's the way it has to be. So would you be willing to take a risk? Would you be willing to do something great for God? Not to make yourself look good, not to make Gordon College look good, but because the Lord has need of you. Let me say that again. The Lord has need of you. There are so many problems around us and so few laborers to make a difference. The Bible says that the people who were working with Nehemiah, that they worked with all of their heart. When was the last time you worked with something with all of your heart? When was the last time you did it? And can you say that when you did it, It was a blessing to other people and not just another bullet on your resume. The world has need of you. Nehemiah was the right person, situated in the right place, and he was willing to do the right thing. You can say rebuilding a wall. Well, so what if it shores up the military defenses of Jerusalem? How is that doing a godly thing? We don't see anybody turning their life over to God. We don't see any signs of inner transformation. One of the key things about the Bible is that it points to a vision for human flourishing, a way in which the world can be a better place. I think that this is part of the biblical canon because there's a lot of godly good that can occur when committed folks who who love the Lord work with all their heart on something that serves the common good, not just their own interests. You see, the problem is that People see us as Christians as just serving our own interest and not the interest of others. Jesus' ministry was fundamentally about transformation. Have we done much to transform the world around us? I look around, I have to tell you, I don't think we've done a great job. But the good news is that it doesn't have to be that way. Nehemiah does something interesting because he's been cupbearer for Artaxerxes and he has this vision to rebuild the wall. But the Bible tells us in chapter 1 he doesn't rush into the king's presence. You see, Nehemiah shows us what it is to be smart and wise and intentional. He waits four months. During those four months, he prays to the Lord for wisdom, for discernment, for guidance of what to do. He then decides to do something very unusual. He walks into the king's presence with a sad countenance. Now you and I don't think much about this, but back in those days, you did not walk into the king's presence with a sad face. It was an insult to the king. It was countercultural. And doing so could actually cost you your life. Most of the time, God uses people who are willing to risk it all for something big. Most of the time... God honors those people who are willing to risk it all for something big. Artaxerxes notices Nehemiah said, and he said, what's going on? Why are you upset? How can I help you? I love the fact that the Bible says that right after that, Nehemiah prays. 
He doesn't immediately respond. He says he's one of these, these sentence prayers. I highly commend them. They've gotten me out of a lot of trouble in the past. I wish I did it a lot more. And then he says, you know, King, the city of my fathers, the wall around it lay in ruins. And I'd like us to do something. I'd like to go back and rebuild it. And I, I wonder if, would you be willing to issue letters to the public officials that would give me safe passage to get there and then help me secure the needed supplies? King Artaxerxes is impressed that Nehemiah has thought through this. He not only does that, but he also says, you know what, I'm going to send you arm, uh, my army officers to accompany you to make sure that this goes well. And then within just eight short weeks, the project is finished. But the real genius of Nehemiah, the way that we know he's not there to serve his own needs, but rather the needs of others, is what happens at the end. He had rallied together thousands of people to try and rebuild this wall. And then he invites the people to stand on the wall with him. He elevates these people, literally and figuratively, to be able to see the good work that what they have done. We talk here at Gordon about how we have this commission by God to try and do something great, to stretch the mind, to deepen the faith. There's a third phrase, elevate the contribution. We get that phrase directly from the book of Nehemiah, from this very idea. We are not here to serve our own interests. We're here to elevate the contribution that we make to the wider world. Because in so doing, God will be glorified and others will be drawn closer to him. It's a good word. The next time you do something great... Figure out a way to bring other people along, to lift them up. In so doing, I think God will elevate the contribution that you're making to the wider world. Nehemiah was the right person, committed to God, and had an active prayer life. He was in the right place, well positioned to be able to make a difference. And he was willing to do the right thing. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Chicago visiting some friends, Walter and Darlene Hansen. Walter was mentioning a book that he was reading, reading at that time. It was a biography uh, of John Stott, the great evangelical pastor. And this biography was written by a historian named Alistair Chapman. The title of the book was Godly Ambition. I've been thinking about what I might share in chapel. And the title just really stood out to me. And it really inspired today's message. John Stott, as you're probably aware, an amazing pastor in London. He wrote, uh, I think, 40 books over the course of his career. The New York Times said that if evangelicalism had a pope, John Stott would be it. His book, Basic Christianity, has been translated into 54 different languages. And here's the amazing thing. John Stott writes all these books and he donates all the royalties of those books to try and help pastors and church leaders in the two-thirds world. Talk about elevating the contribution. It's interesting because Chapman at the very end of his book begins to reflect on John Stott's life. And he said, I, I, I came across this uh, commentary that John Stott had on the Sermon on the Mount. This is the very passage where we hear Jesus telling us to follow a path of meekness and humility. And we get the message in Matthew chapter 6 to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things will be added unto you. Here's what John Stott wrote about that particular passage of scripture. In the end, quote, there are just only two kinds of piety, the self-centered and the God-centered. There's no third alternative. Ambitions for the self can be quite modest, such as enough to eat or enough to drink, or they can be grandiose, like a bigger house, a faster car, a higher salary, a wider reputation, or more power. Ambitions for God, however, if they are worthy, friends, they could never be modest. There's something inherently inappropriate about cherishing small ambitions for God. But when you have a big ambition for God to make your life count for something great, Stott says, then there's no harm in secondary ambitions. Indeed, it's then that secondary ambitions become healthy. Christians should be eager to develop their gifts, to widen their opportunities, to extend their influence, to not build their own empire, but rather through everything to bring glory to God. As I read this book, I thought, how much more does our world need a lot more John Stotts in it? People who were ambitious for the kingdom. His is a life that bears witness to the fact that people can do great things when they avail themselves to God, when they say, I'm willing to lead and to be led.
to try and do something great for you, Lord. Within the Christian community, we don't need any more devotees of mediocrity or advocates for the ordinary. We got plenty of those. But we sure do need a lot more godly ambition. Let's pray. God, may we be people who are drawn to do great things for you. We pray that you will take our minds this day and think through them, take our hands and work through them. Take our hearts and set them afire that we might be changed people having encountered your word for our lives today. This we pray in Christ's name, amen.